Sorry, just a second. Okay, we're good. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Prateep Nayak, and I am the project director of uh, Vulnerability to Viability Global Partnership. Uh, Vulnerability to Vi Viability Global Partnership is a transdisciplinary research and knowledge network with over 100 members from Africa, Asia, Canada, and internationally. The goal of our partnership is to support small scale fisheries in their transition from vulnerability to viability. The V2B Global Partnership aims to identify the diverse uh, factors and conditions that contributes to the vulnerability of small-scale fisheries and engage collaboratively with small-scale fishing communities around the world and other key NGOs, government and university partners to enhance small-scale fisheries viability. We are conducting transdisciplinary community engaged research in six countries uh, of Asia. That includes Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Thailand, and six countries in Africa, including Ghana, Malawi, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, and Tanzania. In doing so, the V2V Global Partnership brings people and organizations together across physical, cultural, disciplinary boundaries through a shared interest in addressing global change impacts on small scale fisheries. Today, I'm very happy to welcome you all to the V2B thematic webinar series, which is an initiative of the V2B Global Partnership to facilitate and generate high level discussions on vulnerability and viability themes and topics within the context of small scale fisheries. The goal is to feature academics, policy and practitioner uh, uh, people, and members of the civil society who have made significant contributions to the theoretical, practical, and policy aspects of small-scale fisheries, both locally and globally. The thematic webinar series of the V2B Global Partnership takes place on the last Friday of every month, and this will take place throughout 2021. This series is available internationally through live streaming on YouTube, details regarding the monthly webinar, including speakers and other uh, web, web links and uh, details is available at our website, which is www.b2bglobalpartnership.org. So today's talk is fourth in the series of the webinar, uh, thematic webinar that we have planned for 2021. And it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Sylvia Salas as our uh, distinguished speaker for today. Sylvia is a fisheries scientist at Cinevest uh, Vista, Merida, Mexico. She holds a PhD in resource management and environmental studies from the University of British Columbia in Canada. Sylvia's research focuses on several issues associated with small scale fisheries. That includes bioeconomic assessment of fisheries, risk and vulnerability associated with decompression of divers in commercial fisheries, issues involving fisheries value chains and fishing uh, fleets uh, dynamics and fisher behavior. Sylvia's research has been published in uh, six books, and one of her books is Right on Small Scale Fisheries Viability and Sustainability that was published by Springer. Uh, and she has published in numerous journals, uh, including but not limited to fish and fisheries, marine policy, fisheries research, Canadian Journal of Fisheries, MBOs, and uh, several others. Sylvia is a member of the Mexican Academy of Science, uh, too big to ignore international uh, ISSF uh, network, network of seas and coasts in Mexico, um, and she is also uh, a co-investigator of B2B Global Partnership Research. She serves as an expert to FAO, WTO, WWF, and OECD, and many other global organizations. It is my honor to invite Dr. Sylvia Salas to deliver uh, a talk to the B2B thematic webinar series today, and her talk is titled as Vulnerability and Viability of Small-Scale Fisheries, 
drivers and prospects. Over to you, Sylvia. Um, you can start now. Hi, Partil. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation to share some ideas about this topic that is really interesting and very relevant within the context of small scale fisheries. I'm going to present first uh, some concepts to get into the, into the theme and follow by the context of the Latin American fisheries, uh, the small scale fisheries, placing some of the main challenges that these fisheries are uh, facing. And I will present two case studies associated to, to this book that we produce within the TVTI network and followed by final remarks. In the last decade, we have been seeing an increase in publication reports associated to the vulnerability of coastal areas and fisheries. And the concept is, is presented by several authors within the context of the impacts and how people deal with different impacts that can come from internal and external factors. It also will depend on the susceptibility and how these factors can potentially have a very adverse effect. Uh, Turner also defines these uh, multidimensional factors uh, within the context of social, economic, and environmental issues, but also the, the impacts can be multidimensional. Why is it important to look at vulnerability in the context of fisheries? Fisheries are very dynamic and com context, uh, complex systems and always exposed to uncertainty along the value chain. So people are exposed to uh, the access to resources, the availability of the resources, re changes in regulation, changes in market, and also very highly exposed to environmental conditions that are changing and impacting their activity along the value chain. This vulnerability is gonna depend on the level of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. This adaptive capacity is gonna be built to a learning process. Once these sources of change can be identified, but also the triggers. When I talk about sources of change or stressors is one thing, but some, some of the triggers might be there but they, they don't respond to those changes until something is um, generated change. So resilience is something that we always try to define also, but uh, and it has it comes this concept from even from physics that has the capacity of a system to return. To the, to the conditions that they were in before they have a, an impact. In this case, we need to evaluate all these components to define the vulnerability and this learning process to get into the resilient system. So I liked um, this diagram that, that was produced by Sinner when assessing the community, fishing communities in Africa to define the concept and it, it assess uh, the communities and the context of sensitivity, adaptive capacity and exposure. So we have this sensitivity has defined as a component of the system to be harmed after the exposure of the stress. And the exposure is defined here for, for the, the circles with different sizes. Um, is going to be defined by the degree of the, the uh, that the system, the region, or the individual has been under this level of stress. This the adaptive capacity is going to depend on the characteristics of the systems or the people that can anticipate the changes and can reduce the effect of those changes on the system as a consequence of those impacts. So here we have that the reduction in, in adaptive capacity, the less the adaptive capacity and the sensitivity can generate more vulnerable systems. Here the red 
the red dots correspond to Kenya. And you can see each of the, the circles are one community. And we have like Mauritanius and Seychelles, like less vulnerable communities, while Kenya and Tanzania has more vulnerable communities. The level of exposure is higher, the, the adaptive capacity is lower, and the sensitivity is very high. So these make very uh, vulnerable systems. The analysis that, that CINER did was analyzing the coral reef areas in those communities. And given the high dependence of the fisheries in those areas generates this vulnerability. So he, he once he finished this, this paper, he also has another paper where he goes deeper in the, in the context of the Kenyan fisheries. And then he presents, he develops this, this diagram that is also very illustrative. So he says that the, we have uh, the ecological vulnerability with all the components of the system, exposure sensitivity and the recovery potential or capacity. But we have also the social system that is highly dependent on the ecological system. So if this system is vulnerable, the system, the social system is gonna be vulner vulnerable. So this generates a socio-ecological vulnerability. The way they assess this vulnerability is looking at different indicators that include the ecological and the socio-economic component. There are many um, analyses that have been, uh, papers that I read that have been following the indicators proposed by, by Sinner. So how people respond, how this adapted capacity can be evaluated. Based on the response, we have to make the distinction between the disruptions and the shocks. The disruptions can be some changes in the system that can be accumulated, but are, are sort of predictable and can generate stress in the communities or the system of the group of people. But they are kind of responding to these changes because they are used to these disruptions. The shocks, however, are unexpected and people are not pre well prepared. So generally the impact can be higher. However, in the context of climate change, we can say that some of this stress or some of the, the changes that these conditions are generating, like increasing storms, the frequency of the storms can have this accumulative process, but also we have the hurricanes that have increased in, in frequency and intensity. So the, the, the climate change has a very high impact within this context. So in times of crisis and times of, here is, is a, a picture of uh, 2020 when we in this area, I, I live here and we were in, in the, the eye of the hurricane because we were in this condition of the pandemic and we had three storms, one after another, and then one hurricane. So these, uh, all the Caribbean area were highly exposed and is one of the, the factors that contribute very highly to the vulnerability of fisheries in this region. So in times of crisis, people could tend to compete or cooperate. You can compete because the resources are limited, but you can also cooperate because you see the advantage of doing so. Then you have to make trade-offs and very important decisions in the right moment. And that happens with COVID. We have this COVID has a good experience, not, not so good to say so, but a, a good experience of how people learn how to cooperate in, time, in times of crisis. I will talk about COVID uh, later in more detail. How we, what are the factors that define this adaptive response? Where well, several authors define that the, the factors that define the adaptive response are ba in, based in the stability, the resources available, and the flexibility of the system, of the community, or from the person. So people can have proactive response or reactive response. The proactive response is, involves a learning process, an adaptive process, and being prepared. 
the reactive response is more waiting for the support of external actors of the external sources of help. But we cannot say that people that are reactive are just lazy or don't want to respond. And I like a lot this the, the chapter that, that Marine included in our book because he made very important emphasis that the response is going to be a, 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 a long process of learning and adapting. So it's going to depend on the type of impact that you receive or the system or the community receives and the intensity and the conditions, the context, the time, the space, and also the institutional context. And when I talk about institutional context, I, I don't talk about only formal institutions. We can have uh, informal local institutions that play a very important role in how people can respond under these conditions of stress. So for the stability, the factors that can contribute is highly, highly important, the level of exposure, the assets available, the access to savings of credit that can be saved by the same people or that can be saved by, by, by an organization or can be saved by, or have this financial support for the person or good in the community can be a very important to generate this stability and especially having alternative sources of income. When I talk about resources, it's not just monetary resources, but also social resources, support from a group, networking, organization, the level of organization within the community. Also some support from the government and the infrastructure. So for instance, evacuation can be easier if, if there are good roads or there is a community clause where I can go in the case of a, a hurricane, for instance. And the flexibility has to do a lot with alternatives. If people have alternative income, if they have that diversification of livelihoods, it's very important for this flexibility. And also the capacity to move or the skills to do something else. If I don't know what else to do, I might not be uh, um, able or willing to leave the community and try something new. We have seen it during this pandemic that many people went into, at least locally here, into construction because the construction didn't stop. So there was an alternative for them while they were not able to fish. So here is another very important concept when we talk about vulnerability and it's viability. Usually we always talk about sustainability of fisheries, but what is sustainable? Sustainable can be maintaining the time, but can be a very bad condition that is maintaining the time. So here is when it becomes important to talk about viability. So the systems are very dynamic. There are many changes that can uh, generate different responses. But sometimes those changes can take you to a point in where there is not a way back or there is not a way to maintain the conditions as they are. So it needs a shift, a very important shift, and it's a buffer. So how to support those, those changes? So the changes can have an impact and generate some outcomes that can be positive or negative depending on the response that the system, the person, or the community have. So in this case, we, we talk about the tipping points. The tipping points can be also defined as the point of no return. The, within this context, the tipping points generate irreversible shifts. So it needs to make a change, an alternative to change so we can reduce the impacts or avoid these highly um, high costs. So here in this diagram, we have this like ecosystem uh, functions and ecosystem structure. Uh, here is the tipping point where you, we have this threshold. So it can go in this direction, but can never go back in this at this level. So we can have a change, a shift that allow some recovery and new stability, new level of stability or we can let it go and allow this degradation process. 
So the system can have a positive or negative outcomes depending on the actions that are taken at this level when a tipping point is reached. To have an example on, on this, I, I can use this, this figure of the, the catches. This is our catch trends on the grouper fisheries, one of the most important fisheries in the region where I work. So people always were concerned and keep in concern about the sustainability of these fisheries. But this sustainability is not just in the context of volume, but also it has a very important impact in the economic activities of the coastal areas and the, the livelihoods of the people that depends on this fishery. We talk about sustainability. During this period, the fishery was sustainable at this level. So in the 70s, this, the fisheries were reaching 20,000 tons. Currently, we, are, we have between seven, 8,000 tons. So each of these periods was uh, sustainable for some time. But once you reach this level, it just generates high concern for the community, for the people that depends on this fishery. So the, the, why this fishery remain or was maintained, because also there was a very important increase in exports and the value of the fishery compensated for the volume. However, the levels that currently are is all, it has generated some worry for the community. And now the stakeholders have decided to work together for the, to develop um, plans of recovery of the system, especially because for export, you need to, have to cover some standards. So this crisis can generate opportunities that can be positive or can be negative, depending on the, on the track that you follow or the group of people follow. And I borrowed this slide from Gary Martin in 2000, that, that is in this site, if you wanna look at it. It's a very interesting uh, uh, presentation that is included in, in there, but I liked this slide that presents the concept of viability has a play. It's a first act, the, the system is sustainable. The second act is there is a negative tip. This could be a negative tip. So we can do something like change from sustainable to unsustainable by introducing destructive fishing methods. So we know that the fishery is in bad shape, but we keep doing something that is not happy for the process of recovery. Or we can have this positive tip as a change from unsustainable to sustainable. And in that case, we can create a marine sanctuary or we can create a recovery plan. So it's a double action of changing the gear. At this moment, it, timely decisions are very important and positive actions also can change from viability to unviability of a fishery. So in this context, how are the conditions of the Latin American fisheries in, in, in this region is, is very complex. Uh, we have different regions that are exploited like Atlantic, Pacific, Amazonian, and there is a lot of inland fisheries in the area. We have different languages, different ethnic communities and different ecosystems. So we cannot generalize about the region at all. This important region contributes with 12% of the total market worldwide. Also, very high contribution of small scale fisheries in the region and um, globally. There is high diversity of ecosystem, as I mentioned, where fish people operate. And so they have to adapt to the biogeographical conditions to operate on, in the system. There are high diversity of the species that are targeted with different, different uh, multiple arts or methods. And there is a very important demand on the region. Looking at the value change analysis, um, something that has been growing in, in this process is our countries, so countries like in Asia or uh, um, in Africa, we generate a high value species and send it abroad and we consume very cheap species. Krona um, um, published a paper very interesting in this context. But also now, if we want to remain this export uh, 
process, we have to cover some requirements according to the market demands. And one of the requirements is have sustainable fishers. They have uh, good practices while fishing. So in this, in this context, illegal fishing or open access conditions don't help so much. So this is one of the challenges that we have in the region. There is interaction among fleets, some of the large scale fleets operating where the small scale fleets operate. There is limited capacity in fisheries assessment and management. We had, uh, we did a, a workshop long ago, but we realized that the, the, the practices of assessment haven't changed much or are highly concentrated on the analysis of the resources and looking very uh, slim within the context of uh, social and economic uh, assessment. So, and we have all these new challenges like climate change and COVID. And some of the species in the region are in the context of overexploitation, like the, the case of the grouper that I already mentioned. So how we can maintain sustainable fisheries when the systems are already vulnerable? How we can define the viability of these fisheries? It's very important because uh, things are changing so fast and the impacts are so evident that we cannot uh, uh, avoid looking at those. So what are the drivers of change? There are many factors that can modify the system that can have an impact in, this, in the context of the activities. So one of those are that there, there are new, or not so new activities that are growing in the coastal area. So they are taking the space for uh, that compete with the fisheries, the small scale fisheries. And those include the urban development, uh, tourism, energy parks that can go inland or even within the, the, the bays. Coastal erosion, uh, pollution, habitat degradation, all of those are gonna affect the resources that generate the, the um, that support the, the, the fisheries that are highly dependent on the livelihoods, the, the local people. One of the very important pro problems that we have been facing, especially in, in the Caribbean area, is this, this problem that the sargassum that has been as a result of changes in, in, in currents. And so also because of those conditions, there are changes on the distribution of the species. And then this is something that, I remember one fisherman told me why I should care for the climate change. Why if this is gonna happen in, in 50 years and as a word, it's not happening in 50 years, it's already happening. People, the, the species distribution are changing. And then maybe you will not be able or your son is not gonna be able to catch whatever you are used to catch. So climate change is there and we have all these drivers of change that can have an impact. And on top of that, if there is not good governance, if there is not a system that can support the communities and, and ensure the sustainability of the resources, the problem can be higher. So we ha can have environmental, economic, and social impacts. Pollution is one very, very, very important problem we have, and especially in, in, in plastics. And this is something that has called the attention more recently. But then it's like we are fighting too many fronts in the region, in the world. And then why we need to assess then risk and vulnerability conditions? Because we need to respond. And also the countries and the government need to respond. And sometimes these countries don't have the capacity to respond on their own. So they need the external support, but the organizations that support need to know how vulnerable the system is, how the countries, and if there are not enough resources, where I should place the money to support the uh, communities that, that are under some disastrous conditions. So some index have been developed by the World Development Bank and di different organizations to assess the level of impact and disasters that can impact in one region. Uh, this, there is this, this report of the International Development Bank by Carlatti that is very interesting presenting the several um, disasters index. 
and they uh, emphasize the, the relevance in the region, in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean region, the flooding, rainfall, storms. So those account for more than uh, above of the 50% of the, the frequency. So we have also hurricanes, epidemics, and fires, and something that is also recognized and um, that all these, these impacts cannot be equally affecting all the countries. And even within a country, there could be a differences. And here, like for instance, the changes in temperature, we can see that the, the major changes have been observed in the Atlantic more than in the Pacific. And here, uh, there is some concern for this, what is called the hot spot in, uh, in front of uh, Uruguay and Argentina. And this is very important because they are highly dependent on bentonic organisms. So the fissures are some like um, the yellow clam is one of the, the resources that have been affected for these changes. So how to address all these problems? So it's when there is not enough support, when there is not enough money to do it. So the, the international organizations are based on assessing indicators, index, but if we don't have that information, if there is not an analysis of what is happening, then there is not a way to, to get that support. So it's very important to have information uh, that can promote and facilitate this adaptation through a cooperative process. And also having that information can help to see, we, need, we can say we need a financial support. How much, how vulnerable the system is, uh, for how long, so that's why it's very important to have this information. So in the case of the climate change, we can have different impacts, many impacts. And given all this, this process associated or these effects associated to the climate change, so the acidification and the, the frequency of the storm, all that can change the ecosystems and the production. And that can affect the composition of the species even the sizes of the organism, we have seen a reduction on sizes in some of the organisms. And then all that, the bleaching of the coral can reduce the productivity of some areas and that affects the fishing, the, the, the tourism, and also the, the storms can affect safety and infrastructure of the coastal areas. And all that can generate risk and uncertainty, and then has an impact on the society as a whole. So that requires adaptation, mitigations, and money, again, money. So it's, it's very important to have these resources, but the other problem is how these resources are gonna be allocated, or, or depending on the level of exposure, depending on the level of vulnerability. So here, uh, it's very important to bring another concept that is preparedness for the response. The preparedness within, for these shocks, for those changes. So disaster preparedness involves, it can be defined for individuals, communities, and government. So all of those need to be prepared. And that is includes uh, with this three component that is awareness, response, and recovery. So awareness to anticipate the changes and how to get ready to have a, a response that can depend on willingness of, of evacuate or willingness to cooperate. I remember a fisherman that was telling me that when uh, we had this hurricane Isidore in 2002, he didn't want it to be evacuated and he suffered so much with him during the period of, of that the hurricane hit in his community. And he said, now the first that gets into the bus when it's an evacuation is me. So response because of this learning process People are more willing to, to cooperate and not ready to face those changes. And the third one is recovery, because this recovery doesn't depend on the government to do everything. So it, it's depending on the cooperation of all those involved. So it needs also to have a contingency plan. So if you are prepared and you know that this could happen, then you can prepare and you can have some saving for this potential uh, disaster conditions, especially in those areas that were highly exposed to those um, hurricanes or storms. 
here in the in the tropical areas we just get prepared you have almost i don't know i don't i cannot tell how many things you look at when you know that there's a hurricane coming you have to be prepared and that is because there is a learning process we learn we have to adapt and then you invest in safety you invest in, in measures and some communities here um, in the area has once the hurricanes hit and their the water the salt water cover gets into their houses was destroying their the, the walls so they started to put some some cover into the walls so that now they are protected even if they they get some flooding in the area so they are investing on the on, on this um, getting prepared. And also it's very important to have a long-term planning. So in this context, uh, uh, generally we need <laughs> the, other, the other problem that we have in some cases is that the government changes and then the plan changes and then it's not continuity and those long-term planning. To need to have a, a contingency plan that can be applicable, in, applicable regardless of who's there. So here, the way I, I present now, uh, within those case studies that I was talking, referring to, to about the, the case of the tsunamis, the earthquake and tsunamis that hit in 2004 and 2010 in the Pacific area. So in, in 2010, uh, according to the reports, 53 countries were sent an alert of the tsunami. And among those, Peru, Chile, and Colombia were in, in, in this region. And um, Marine presents an analysis of the assessment of what happened during the, earth, the, the tsunami and after the tsunami. So the contingency plan for recovery and also how, how people responded during the tsunami. So he reports that 80% of the Chilean population was affected. It was a very, very huge impact. Uh, it covered 600 kilometers of coastline, affecting tourism and fishing. Has the main activities within the region, and they lost the fishing capacity in 60%, which, which demands 30 billion US dollars to recovery in the recovery plan. This due to the lack of preparedness. And there were many important environmental changes in the landscape. Some people, so, some areas that were dry got uh, water and some areas that were had water got dry and they remain like that. So the changes were permanent. So what he did was using this social network analysis, uh, assessing how people responded during the, the contingency and how people responded after the contingency. So he said that there were not too many fatalities because people were very responsive to evacuate, regardless that they didn't have enough information that prevent them from, from the tsunami because it, it, it seemed that was like two, one or Three, three big, big waves that that came uh, with uh, some spacing in time. So uh, this is very important. It's not this earthquake that you you feel and then you can have some uh, momentum. But it, it was uh, uh, three events, very important, um, um, big uh, events. So because people had the experience in 2004, now they were ready to evacuate. So. However, because of the changes in the, in the area, there were changes in the livelihoods. People had to adapt and had to, to look for new alternative uh, livelihoods. And uh, the disaster and re rehabilitation policies, however, were not uh, equally applied in all the region. So in this context, Marine makes an emphasis that in literature, many people refer to the network, networking and social capital has the capacity to define the, the capacity to respond. But he also indicated that it's a lot to do with the, the, the amount of damage that have the area. 
and the isolation. So if, if the, the, the area can be very isolated, the capacity of recovery can be limited. So it's, it's what I, I refer that, that Marine indicated that we shouldn't place only to the social capital and networking the, the capacity of recovery, but it's, it's very important to indicate the level of damage and the conditions of the area. Something that also he wants to address is that a paternalistic response can undermine the individual and collective capacity of organization and response. So he said that they analyzed, he analyzed 21 organizations and he defines the post-disaster recovery trajectory with these five components from innovation to recession. And from the, 11, the 21 organizations that he worked on, only three of them had got in, into, after four years, achieved this, this level of innovation or normalization. And 11 of them were in the recession process still. So as um, I, I mentioned, there is not the capacity of the system. It's going to be equally uh, uh, responsive to recover. So there are many issues that have to be looked at when we talk about uh, adaptability. And just going from this big case into a, a more local case and, uh, in the assessment of risk and safety, I want to present the case of the, the uh, analysis made by, by my colleague Hashim and, and some colleagues from University of California and I had collaborated with them. So in this case, the analysis was placed on, uh, an, um, analyzed the perception of risk of the divers and also the risk of the compression. So we have different response or attitudes toward risk from all of us, from people. We can be risk averse or risk prone and it all depends on the, our previous experience so if we have a bad experience under some conditions, we are gonna be more risk averse, but also depending on the expected benefits, we could be risk prone. So depending on the confidence on the resources we have to respond or the fisher have to respond, and then we have something in between. So um, the fishers got this computer in, in, in their suit so they could we could grab information on time depth species and location so time and depth define a lot the, the risk of the compression so this information could be the the information downloaded a computer and we were able to see to analyze the diving behavior of the fisherman so here this is the, the diving behavior pattern of a diver that fish lobster and then this, the pattern is they go down, get lobster, go up, give the lobster to the fisher that is in the boat and go down and again, down, up and down. We call it this jojo uh, pattern. And sometimes fish, uh, the divers don't have a, a stop or the compression stop here. In the case of the, the sea cucumber, they go down, they have a sack where they, they put the, the sea cucumber and they keep down all the time until they get up. So both of those patterns are risky. So what we saw also is that when the abundance of both of the resources in, um, decline, fishermen went to other areas that could be deeper and could spend more time diving, which exposed them to high vulnerability. In the case of the sea cucumber also, they could remain long time. We had a record of one diver that was 120, more than two hours diving there with not stop. So all of these conditions expose the divers to vulnerability and decompression. And what, what to do with these conditions? So, the, the, this learning process has been an incentive, especially for my colleague, to keep working with the communities. So uh, among the, 
the interventions actions that we had was la the modification of the hookah system because also the divers were uh, having some problems with the pollution um, of the of the diving system for carbon monoxide because the the way and the system operated they have this compressor and one, and one house that can be 100 meters and they can be diving forever there almost so the one of the the interventions was to modify the system we didn't have enough money to do much more than eight eight uh, modify eight compressors but the experience and what the results that we showed to them made an incentive for the others to make changes on their own after the intervention we had a few months later, 30 more compressors were adapted, and now there are many more. Also, uh, there is a, he developed a, this manual for safety uh, measures and how one uh, my colleague is a medical doctor. So one of the risk, the factors that we're analyzing too is what, what were this, the health conditions of the fishermen that can make them prone to the compressions. So also there was a program developed to have some um, campaigns going into the communities to check up of the fishermen, some training for first aid, and also to increase the capacity to respond to these conditions. So this learning process, like in the case of, 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 of the big tsunamis can teach us how to go about those changes and, and also small uh, com work in a small community also can teach us how to to work and keep the attention in some of the important issues that can generate vulnerability and also the most important how to go about that so here is another very important case that is teaching us that vulnerability is there and that the impacts are there so we had kobe with all these challenges placed into the whole world no, and the fissures are not the exception. So in addition to all these factors that I refer that are there, that are already placing some stress into the communities, into the, into the fisheries, into the ecosystems, we had COVID. So there was all these accumulative disruptions and the reconfiguration of the value chain. So the, the lack of mobility reduces the exports tourists and all that affected the value change along the, the, the communities. And then also, as I mentioned, we have uh, this in the Caribbean, all these hurricanes hitting, and then people were recovering and there is here another one coming. So with all these conditions and lack of mobility, there was also limitations to the some surveillance and the increase in illegal fishing has been reported in many, many places. What it, are the positive outcomes of these very bad conditions, some adaptations. So there was a social economic health impact that generated vulnerability. And maybe the viability of some communities or some uh, industries or some uh, sectors is still, is still at, at risk. So that one of the adoptions when was adoption of technology and searching for new markets. The problem is that not everybody can have the same level of adoptions or same conditions to look for these new markets or adoption of technology. Uh, CEPAL uh, reports that there is a very important digi digital gap. So in, in, in our region, so we have very many countries, especially in the South. South America is in a better condition than Central America. And even within one country, we have very different conditions. I always say that we have different Mexico within Mexico because the conditions in the South are very different to, this, to the North and the North Pacific or the South Pacific. So we have to look at those differences when assessing this vulnerability and viability. We had recently a, a panel where we were discussing the impact of COVID and this is uh, some of the results presented by my colleague, by my colleague uh, Christina Pita and then so what were the ships? This is when the ships, this, this viability, searching for this viability to maintain the activity. They're shifting the gears. And some of the shifting of the gears involved changes in targeted species, 
some of those that remain fishing were searching for a species that had low value but more abundance so they don't invest too much they don't have too much cost on the trip that they can recover the cost of the trip changes in fishing effort um, and changes in the presentation of the products that they catch so how to maintain we have a product that needs uh, uh, infrastructure to maintain the product so, and you don't have this infrastructure, especially in the conditions of COVID, how to deal with that, just changing, freezing, smoking, dry, drying, find new markets, new buyers. And it, of course, many of those were in the, in the hope of getting some financial aid. And some was this direct market through e-market, uh, uh, local consumption. So, Many of these things were possible because there was cooperation. Cooperation within the community, cooperation with government, cooperation with organization of social uh, civil society. So some of the people were willing to start reopening their activities and exposing themselves. I remember talking to one, um, the owner of a big plant that said, you know, I, I cannot stop because if I stop, all the people that depends on, on me is, is there. But, and so they he made a contact, <coughs> direct contact with restaurants in the state. So he caught all the middlemen that he had in, before just trying to sell his products to also maintain the activity running. So another thing that, that can show the, the relevance of cooperation is that at, at the region, we have different groups or, or organizations that can and are already working, trying to, to help in this very difficult time from the local to the international. At the international level, FAO has uh, presented several virtual uh, dialogues and, and promote exchange among ministers of the countries, also several meetings and how to connect and some market connection, sharing information. Some of the banks have been also analyzing the conditions to promote and give credit at the regional level. And we have these, these networks that have been very important to keep feeding with information, like the Hidden Harvest and TBTI group that have uh, always trying to raise the profile of small scale fisheries, presenting information and the organization of civil society are very important here. They have been like a bridge, a bridge with the government and academics and communities. So those organizations are at the, at the international or local level. At the regional level in, in Central America, we have OSPESCA, we have CARICOM, and all of those are trying to create this, this crossing uh, interaction sectors. And at, this, at the country level, it, things are, are very different depending on the conditions of each country. And, but many of those have placed a high importance to the process of technology, of how to adapt techno technology. Because technology has been also very important now for school, for education, we cannot stop that. So this has been a very important process here. And at the local level, we have this local trade and how to rebuild uh, livelihoods and at the regional level and all the getting searching for support. Uh, one of the problems is here, of course, the countries have been more uh, weight to the sanitary context to try to control the sanitary problem. So if you have limited resources, where are you gonna place? And when I talk about resources, it's not just money. It's also people, it's, it's uh, who is gonna do the job. And that has been a really big, big problem in, in the current conditions we're living in. But with that, it's, it's even more important to recognize that we are in a context in which vulnerability is there. The conditions of uncertainty and risk are there. So we need to recognize that to be able to move from this resistant capacity to a transformative capacity and generate some resilience. So need to learn that 
we have the generic contingency plan that can work in the long term to change this reactive response to a more proactive response. So here it's very important to have assessments, to have groups of people like this group of B2B that are working to do this assessment of the factors. What are the factors? If we don't know what are the factors that generate vulnerability, we cannot develop this contingency plan. We cannot develop uh, adaptive responses. We cannot develop proactive responses. So it's very important to have ocean planning too, because the risk is there. And it's very important to uh, foster, promote local uh, cooperation to uh, build capacity. So in this context, um, also uh, TVTI developed a project that is called Blue Justice that is generating some kind of observatory. If we don't know what is happening, nothing will happen. We cannot solve the problems. If we don't know what are the risks, then the risk and the people that are under the conditions of risk will not get, atten will not get attention. So this uh, idea of kind of observatories or a system where people can place their concerns about the potential risk into their community, into their, their uh, livelihoods is, is a project that uh, TBTI is leading in this uh, project of Blue Justice. So we have resources. We have all these tools like the Sustainable Development Goal. We have the, the, the fisheries guidelines. We have people working, developing like some report that had helped us. I think it's too much information there. In fact, it's too much that we, we sometimes don't have the capacity to assimilate, to integrate, but it's there. We have, we can uh, work together because we have those tools. And also we have this networking, these groups that can facilitate and, and help to learn and to, to, to create this networking. This social capital cannot be only in, in the communities of the government, but also into the academia, into the society that can build a capacity to move forward. So we have the tools, we have the people. And with this, it's, it's important, I want to stress the relevance to assess the context because not even within one region, even within one country, or even within one community, the context could be different. So we have to say the context to, to be able to have uh, timely decisions to respond. And we have to accept that the uncertainty is there, the risk is there, and we cannot change it, but we can reduce uncertainty with knowledge, with information. And after the crisis, we need to be adapted but going into a positive adaptation and moving from vulnerability to viability. We need to build capacity at different levels, financial level, uh, uh, different learning process that can help people to rebuild their ecosystems, to rebuild their fisheries, to rebuild their communities. So also it's very important that the policymakers can promote proactive strategies, not paternalistic strategies that leave the community or the people very highly dependent on those external supports. It's important to bridge ties among the actors and uh, move forward. And to enhance this adaptive capacity, we need cooperation, organization at the local, national, and international level. We can use those resources. They are already there, but we, we need to learn how to use them. And with this, I, I conclude. Thank you so much. Did you have any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. You know, you know, that was a really great uh, example of the multidimensional nature of vulnerability and viability uh, and uh, kind of you know, providing a direction towards uh, uh, you know, more proactive and transformative you know, actions that is required on the ground and elsewhere you know, to, in order to achieve uh, the transition from vulnerability to viability. I see that uh, we are already flooded with questions uh, on YouTube. Uh, may I just ask uh, uh, Simmer to uh, 
you know, transport those questions from YouTube live stream to, uh, to, to uh, this platform. So sure. we can engage in a discussion. Okay. Um, well, the first question we have is from Emily. Uh, she, mentioned, she mentions, um, you mentioned cooperation or competition for fish between fisheries. Um, have dolphin and whale interactions and bycatch impacted this and increased competition for fish in any way? Um, I think this question is asking what the role of bycatch plays in cooperation and competition amongst fishers. Yeah, well, this is a very, very tricky <laughs> problem because also I just got a paper that I will uh, I will share with you about this uh, viability of the the vaquita we have in, in Mexico, you know, because when, when vaquita is is a population that is very uh, reduced now, and they get uh, trapped in the nets of uh, fishers that catch totuaba, but totuaba is already illegal also to catch totuaba, but they are, they keep on catching totuaba. And then the, the competition, uh, we have two sectors, at, or I don't know if we can call it two sectors, but uh, bycatch uh, now is, is one of the big problems that remains. And then competition, I don't, I don't know if we can call this competition when we talk about bycatch because it's, you have those that are trying to reduce these bycatch problems that are affecting the ecosystem because if we affect the ecosystem at the end, we are gonna affect the, the, the resources that are also in this system that the fishers depend on. So those things, and, and for instance, we had an embargo in Mexico for several several years with the tuna because of the dolphin, the dolphin programs. What it created was programs to reduce the bycatch, but also programs to uh, promote cons local consumption also here. We have also this, this threat of, of being having another embargo because of the vaquita. So this goes beyond cooperation or competition. We need to work together, of course, but then the, the problem here can be bigger, can go beyond even that, that situation. What I was talking about cooperation and competition was also who, 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 we, who you favor. You cannot favor or they say just, just you favor the fishermen, you favor the, the dolphins. It's how we solve the problem in order to reduce the impact. That, that's a different context. But if we are in this condition, just put in the context of cooperation and competition, vaccination now, how many people will be able to be vaccinated? So if you have an opportunity, you run for the vaccine. You are not waiting for your neighbor to come with you. You run for the vaccination now. Is, is what I was referring with this competition or, or uh, cooperation thing. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, from Vagash Rav. Good evening from India. Just think if adaptive responses can be defined with respect to some thresholds of sustainable operations, because it seems that under certain compelling circumstances that force to cross that threshold, the qualitative or quantitative nature of this adaptive response may undergo substantial change. Yes, yes, of course, totally, totally agree with that quality of those changes because it's not just to change, it's you have to change for, for better. Yeah. Right. And then um, there is just a quick comment on um, the information on diving behavior is interesting. Some confusion regarding the behavior of the sea cucumber in response to resource abundance. Yeah, what happened is that like the sea cucumber doesn't move, like the lobster moves. So there is more searching process. So once, but if, if the, the diver finds a very good place where there is a lot of sea cucumber, they're gonna remain until they clean the area. That's the difference between lobster and, and and sea cucumber. Okay. Um, those were all the questions. There okay. are many thank yous for presentations today. Okay, I have a question from Derek uh, Armitage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This was really informative. Could you take a bit more about talk a bit more about examples of successful decision making or governance process that helped to shift gears 
as you say, from vulnerability to viability or move from reactive to proactive processes where local or regional scale. I'm wondering if uh, yeah. there are good co-management examples that, ha that have helped. Yeah, I guess uh, we have, uh, here we have in, in the area, for instance, uh, communities in, that were operate in one bay that, and they allocated right for within the bay for what they call parcellas. So fishermen can fish in their area, they place artificial habitats to fish lobster. And there is a co-management program there. So according to the law, <laughs> the sea cannot be parcelated. The sea cannot be owned by people. But like the government see that this is working for the community, they haven't modified the system. So in that case, they have favor that system and even promoted that they have shown those examples of good management within the, the communities. And then it started with one bay. Now we have the South Bay also uh, that are doing the same. So if the system works for them, even it goes, uh, could say that goes against the law, uh, but within some rules that are uh, for the benefit of the ecosystem and for the benefit of the community, the government are favoring those, those, those programs of uh, co-management. And another uh, issue of, of proactive response uh, regarding the proactive or reactive response, like in our country, we had with this pandemic situation that some of the fishermen got some money. So they, they were working, waiting for this, this money. Uh, and then even the, the government created a, a record of the fishermen. There was already a record, but they said, okay, we're gonna create a new record of the fishermen, so we give the support. So people that were not even fishermen or they were just relatives of the fishermen got into that list to get the money. You know? But this money was a <laughs> very limited money that some of the fishermen told me they were getting a card, a card that they can exchange, they can get some food supplies only in one store, you know? So that limits because I said I have other needs. I have needs for for uh, so, uh, sanitary supplies. I cannot get there. But with this system, it's not working. So there are some things that might be a goodwill, but uh, at the end, the effect could not be the expected one. So we can have some uh, things that can, at the moment, solve the problem. But in the long term, it's not solving the problem because it's not creating the capacity that can strengthen the conditions of the people and the community. I don't know if that, the, the question could, was go, going in that direction. There is, uh, are you reading it? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, there is one more question from John Majaya Mishra. Um, he's saying, thank you, Prof. Sylvia, for the nice presentation. How do relevant policies shape the transitions from vulnerability to viability of small-scale fisheries in Mexico? Please share some insights. Thank you. Okay. I guess well, this concept of viability is, is just taking some momentum. Uh, at least from what I have been searching, it's, 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 it's been there for a long time, but we haven't been adopting that until more recently. And I think it's because we have been uh, recognizing the relevance of addressing vulnerability. So in terms of, of how to promote viability, there are, I think in, in our country, I always say that my country has a lot of, of laws, policies. The problem we have sometimes is with the implementation. I don't think I, I am just trying to, to recall some of the actions that could be driven into that. Okay, yeah. One, the, the, um, the policymakers that are in charge of environmental um, issues, and there is, we have CONAM that works in protected areas. So one of the things that some of the programs associated that CONAM has been promoting 
with fishermen that are in the area is to generate some capacity. For instance, in, in, in um, there is a coral reef in, in the Caribbean where they have for, uh, created some like, um, uh, they, they used to have uh, just the small houses, like a camp going there. They didn't have access to fuel. So they, they gave some program to support, to create some infrastructure that could favor them, especially because once they get into the reef, they don't have anything there. So they have to, to be uh, protected. So they, the program facilitated some improvement in that area. This is the Banco Chinchorro where they, they, they fish uh, lobster, uh, conch, and some uh, fish species. And then also giving some training, some capacity building for uh, recognize the relevance of, of uh, sustainability of the resources. I think CONAM has done some of this work. So, so it's not like a global government. So it's just by sections, maybe we have some cases but we need to, to learn more about this viability issue. I think it's more, more recent that we have been taking more emphasis on that. Okay. There is okay. one more question by Anna Carolina. Uh, Anna is asking, you know, can we take vulnerability and viability as two sides of the same coin? And uh, what are some of the, you know, interactions between them? I would not say that because uh, in fact, the threshold comes when vulnerability is there. So that's when you have to make this shift to viability. It's like people talk, it's, it's the, the resilience is the opposite of vulnerability. But as I mentioned, we have to look at all the components because like uh, there could be a system or a country or a community that are, is highly exposed, but it has very high adaptive capacity. So it's the level of vulnerability is not gonna be the same that one that is with very low exposure, but very limited capacity. So we have to look at all the components of vulnerability. I will not simplify this as a, uh, uh, the, the opposite. Uh, so how do you place, um, uh, I don't see any co uh, other questions from you too, just, you know, just to kind of you know, uh, link to some of your reflections on viability earlier. How do you link vulnerability to uh, sustainability uh, in your analysis? Is vi uh, sorry, uh, viability is, uh, and sustainability. So is viability then a component of sustainability? Sustainability being- Is viability what? Is, is viability then a component of sustainability? So in that case, sustainability being the larger goal and viability is just one key component of. I guess, I guess uh, you can make a system uh, sustainable. So if you make it viable, but you can have something that can be, you know, it's an example that we were saying that, um, you can be in a community where there are um, all the possibilities to have an activity uh, and can be uh, fisheries very active and sustainable. But now fishermen don't want to be there. So it's not viable. It can be sustainable, but it's not viable because the conditions that to maintain that activity is not there, are not there. Mm -hmm. So there is more incentive to migrate or go. So, that's what I said, it not, can be that simple. But you can have a fishery that can be in a very uh, bad shape and then you shift the gear to make it sustainable. That's when you leave because this condition of vulnerability of the, of the fishery requests, demands a change that make it sustainable and viable. So it can be viable and sustainable. I think uh, we are at time. Uh, so I want to bring this to an end with a huge thank you to uh, um, Dr. Sylvia Salas you know, for uh, really you know, a wonderful and enriching uh, presentation, right you know, addressing the core issues in way to be vulnerability to viability in a global partnership because we ask all these questions all the time. 
uh, through our different activities. And uh, thanks for enlightening us uh, on, on those key questions as we explore them further. Uh, uh, but also a, a huge thank yous to uh, our audience who most of us, uh, most of them have joined uh, via the YouTube live stream. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, those meaningful questions and engaging uh, you know, uh, through the B2B Global Partnership uh, webinar platform. Um, we look forward to seeing you uh, in the next uh, month uh, webinar. Um, and similar, if you can bring up the poster um, um, to the screen. So uh, next month, um, we have uh, Dr. Martin Bavink from the Center for Maritime Research in the University of uh, Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands, who is going to talk about is illegal uh, legal pluralism a ban or a boon for small scale fishing communities uh, with all his experiences you know, working in uh, both in the developed and the developing world on small scale fisheries and communities. Uh, I'm you know, really looking forward to this talk next month uh, to be another wonderful piece uh, in addition to our B2B Global Partnership thematic work. You know, webinar series. Um, we look forward to seeing you there. And uh, thank you, Sylvia, once again. And thank you to everyone who joined thank us uh, today. Thanks very much. Bye -bye. Thank you.